<laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. We've had a little technical difficulty, but that is okay. Uh, my name is Jade Alberts, the founder of Peer Guidance. We listen, guide, and connect small businesses, startups, and entrepreneurs. Sharing knowledge is why I started the Telling It Like It Is Facebook Live. It is live. If you have any questions, please ask away. If you're watching us after the fact, uh, feel free to ask your questions. We will get back to you. I would like to thank COVID Continuity for their sponsorship. They are a community of digitally connected, like-minded entrepreneurs, leaders, and champions who believe in the power of collaborating to support the recovery of our local and global economies. Today's Telling It Like It Is guest is J.S. Rio, uh, CEO of Indefinite Arts. J.S., thank you for joining me, and how are you today? Thank you. Uh, really excited to be with you. I'm doing well. How are you? I've actually had a great week. I got a haircut. I've had a face-to-face -face coffee meeting. We have a, a little meeting today, so um, it's 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 exciting. Fantastic. I know I, I know we're going to be talking a little bit about art, so I wanted to make sure everybody knows that I'm wearing my Bob Ross shirt. I thought it was a good day to kind of bring the, to br break that out for uh, for telling it like it is interview. Great. <laughs> So I know you and I met through uh, Brent Chio, who was our, our guest last week, and we've had a couple meetings, and uh, I'm really intrigued about what Indefinite Art does, so I'm excited about uh, Brent introducing us and uh, obviously getting to know you a little better. Absolutely. So what I'll do here is I will give a brief introduction, and then we will uh, get into the questions. So JS is the in is the CEO of Indefinite Arts Center in Cal Calgary. It is Canada's oldest and largest disability arts organization. JS was named one of the Calgary's top 40 under 40 by Avenue at Magazine in 2019, and he has transformed the center, increasing its revenues by 60% to over 1.6 million in less than three years and providing exciting platforms for artists with disabilities to create and present their work locally and around the world. Previous roles include senior consultant, Alberta Medical Association, principal speechwriter to the ambassador of Japan, and director in external relations to the Banff uh, relations of the Banff Center. So, I mean, that's an impressive resume, and obviously everything you go has been has been done to give back, which is excellent. So. I mean, as I've gotten to know you and we've had a few meetings, I've really been impressed with the Indefinite Arts Center. So can you please tell us what role it plays in our community? Sure thing. Uh, like you say, it's Canada's oldest and largest disability arts organization, which I think surprises a lot of people that it happens to be in Calgary. Uh, we were founded in 1975 and today we support more than 300 artists who live with both physical and or developmental disabilities. And by supporting them, we're talking about basically opening up the entire creative process to be accessible for these artists, starting with artistic training to providing different creation opportunities, as well as exhibition and marketing opportunities, uh, as you mentioned, both locally and around the world. So re really, in essence, we're providing uh, a very authentic platform for individuals with disabilities to uh, grow and be celebrated and showcased as artists. So how, how does how does one person uh, get involved as an artist with your uh, with the center? I think it's really interesting uh, to note that uh, anybody uh, who identifies as having a disability can have the opportunity to be an artist at our center. Um, unfortunately, that also leads to a quite an extensive wait list and a quite an extensive wait time to get in because we are a very popular uh, program for the disability community. Uh, but uh, what sets us apart is there are no prerequisites. Uh, it's simply a matter of whether or not one has a passion for art. And so what we're finding uh, is a community of individuals who have different experiences as artists but to have that sort of common dedication and passion for the arts. And we work with them on a fairly individualized basis to help them achieve their goals as far as what it is that they want to create and how they want to be seen and showcased as an artist. No, I think that's in the center, obviously, uh, COVID, and I, and I saw everybody energy there is absolutely outstanding. And I kind of just want to touch a little bit on, on the COVID. How have the artists been doing since uh, they haven't been had access to, to the center? 
Uh, it's been a challenge for sure. It's a challenge for all of us, uh, whether we identify as having a disability or not. But I would argue that, you know, you and I have the luxury of having family and social supports. We can easily access, uh, you know, arts and culture. Uh, we can access social interactions, you know, even in our front porch by having chats with our neighbors. But I would argue that those are some of the things that uh, aren't readily accessible for our particular community. And so uh, the fact that we have remained a relevant and responsive organization in providing uh, programming using virtual, using mail and using phone supports uh, has been incredibly meaningful for a community where um, isolation and mental health challenges are, are, are often the norm, even in the best of times. So it's been a very meaningful time for us to continue to reach out and, and incredibly meaningful to see how our artists have responded during this time. No, I, I agree. And I'm, I'm talking with J.S. Rio, CEO of Indefinite Arts. And, and I mean, one thing that I want to, I just want to, you know, bring up is that you can just click on the, on, uh, in the comment section and go right to their website. And you guys created a great video showing how the artists responded when you guys were dropping off some of the artwork. And I mean, I think it was about two minutes long, a summer around there, and I, I was sitting there and my heart was melting. And I highly recommend everybody going to check out that video. Like that was just an outstanding job, uh, you know, doing that. So, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. That was excellent. So I know um, you guys have a great mission and there, there are some uncertainties moving forward, obviously, but what is the mission and long-term goals for for the Indefinite Arts Center? Well, when I started this role about uh, now coming into three years, uh, three years ago, um, it was it was, and I would argue that it still is a relatively unknown organization. But we're doing our darndest to change that. Uh, but three years ago. Uh, I came upon an organization that I think really saw itself as much more of a social service rather than being uh, seen or recognized as an arts organization. And so over the past three years, we've made very deliberate sort of strategic shifts in positioning not only our organization as a bona fide arts organization, but also positioning our what we used to call clients as actual bona fide artists. And so uh, long term, it's about uh, you know, going even deeper into that, right? Providing as, as many supports, as, as many programs, as many opportunities that allow our artists to ad advance, them, advance themselves in their artistic practice. Um, so whether those are, you know, expanded programs, expanded international exposure, um, you know, additional sort of dis multidisciplinary opportunities, um, there are a whole range of things that we can be doing to uh, you know, explore the whole gamut of the arts and, and providing as many of those opportunities to our participants. Do, uh, do a lot of the artists want to sell their work or is it just something that they just want to come in and it gives them a sense of community? I think that's part of the transition. Um, you know, three years ago, uh, not a lot of artists were selling their works, probably because we weren't providing as many of those opportunities as we should have. And so that concept of what it means to sell work, uh, aside from the monetary transaction that happens when one sells their work, it's that conversation around what it is that that artist is doing, which is really about giving their creativity to be shared in another community or another home and in another setting and that concept has has not been I, I don't think discussed at length with a lot of our artists in, in in the past and so those are conversations that we're absolutely expanding on now um and i think the other thing was more or less around not knowing what kind of a response uh, they would be getting from their artwork. One of the first sort of things that we were able to do was uh, uh, hold our first ever international art auction in Hong Kong where many of our artists' works were selling for over $1,000 a piece. And, uh, and again, it's not just about the monetary value. However, the fact that our artists, many of our artists who were represented at, the, at that auction were generating uh, a meaningful income from their creativity has definitely shifted that conversation quite a bit. And so what we're finding now is a lot more artists who are very keen on not only selling their works, but also working on commissions as well. That is interesting. And I guess that kind of, I want to come back to the artists in a little bit, but when you talk about the, the sale and, and, and fundraising, 
So the importance of strategic planning and, and moving forward, I mean, it's going to be a loud and crowded environment for nonprofits lately. How are you going to differentiate yourself to, to stay relevant? I think that's uh, that's that's the multi-million dollar question for many charities, uh, especially in Calgary. Uh, I think that um, the first and foremost, I would say that funders and partners like to fund bold ideas and they want organizations to take risks. Uh, I think they are getting bored with sort of previous models of how things are done and they want to see what an organization is doing to think about the future. And of course, what, 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 a, better, what a better time could it be uh, in this pandemic for organizations to actually think about what the future looks like. And so I think in the past three years, we've been very bold about what kind of what kinds of risks we want to take, especially given that uh, when we look at any other sort of disability arts organization, any of our partners, uh, I would argue that none of them have really taken a lot of those bold risks, which means that the path that we take has not been taken by any other organization. So there isn't sort of a blue book on how to succeed or how to grow or how to provide additional programming. And so, uh, and I, I even think that that excites partners, right? The, the uncertainty of, yeah, actually let, let's have a look at how, how successful you'll be guided by a very deliberately developed strategic planning process where we set those clear end goals or that markers of success. Um, I think offering that clarity while at the same time offering that um, excitement around our boldness has has allowed us to grow, as you said, 60% over the past three years, especially in you know the, the worst, most ongoing recession our city has faced in, in, in our generation, uh, I think has been uh, attributed to those two things. Um, and moving forward, I think we will need to absolutely continue that and reflect on our strategic plan, especially in the midst of this COVID pandemic about you know, what does a post-pandemic world look like for a disability arts organization like ours. How have your conversations gone with some of your partners? Are they, um, obviously, some of them have probably been affected during the, the COVID crisis here. Have, have they been positive? Have they been you know, supportive and saying, yeah, we'll keep the long haul? The, the immediate response we got was, wow. Um, you might know that in less than two weeks from closing down our center uh, and, and then relaunching our new range of programs took a short two weeks. Uh, and I think the quick turnaround and the flexibility and the, the adaptability our team has demonstrated has absolutely wowed our partners. Um, and, uh, you know, I've worked for much larger organizations um, and, uh, and, and that's not easy to turn around a larger boat. So I think there's definitely benefits of having, you know, I think our, our team complement right now is about 15 staff in total. And the fact that we all were able to quickly navigate through all the challenges and, and relaunch in less than two weeks and come out strong in, within that time uh, has really impressed our partners and I think gives them reassurances uh, uh, that that we're a, we're a deserving partner, that we are a partner that's worth investing in. And uh, and when we look at, uh, especially in the art sector right now, that's not, that's not a common pattern we're seeing. I mean, a lot of other arts organizations, not because of any fault of their own, a lot of arts organizations are struggling. Um, but in our case, like I said, quick two weeks, quick turnaround, quick adaptability has really impressed our partners. Oh, that, that's great to hear, JS. Uh, again, I'm Dr. JS, CEO of Indefinite Arts Center. I mean, I talk about in all the time that employees are the heartbeat of a company, and obviously your artists are. are are, are the heartbeat of the Indefinite Arts Centre. And as I said, when, when I was there, the energy and seeing the laughter and the smiling, and I, I was just impressed. So are you able to, you know, or please do share some stories about your artists, maybe selling some of their art or just how they work together, just some really feel good stories. Sure, uh, you know, when we, when we have 300 artists that come through our space <laughs> each week, there are 300 different stories uh, every single week, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, what I'll, I'll begin sort of at, the, at a high level. You know, many of our artists who have a developmental disability uh, have had a lot of challenges in their lives. Uh, and uh, as, they're, uh, as they move into adulthood, um, they are you know, brought into different supportive environments. 
and uh, and we often take on artists who have on their file, you know, behavioral challenges or always getting themselves into conflict, and you know, the list goes on and on and on. What I think stuns so many, and it's no longer surprising to me, three years into this job, is that their involvement and their ability to communicate and their their ability to shine as artists uh have has really simply eradicated a lot of those behaviors so in the end um you know months into their onboarding as an artist we have support workers and other supportive agencies coming to us and going what is your secret what are you doing that is completely changing the outlook and completely changing the attitude of this particular artist and i think that's really quite fascinating uh i i will say that as an organization, we, you know, the, the common theme here is we've been taking a lot of risks. One of the things that we've done is really, um, there's two things. One of the things has been, uh, again, providing the same kinds of opportunities that would be afforded to an artist without a disability, we're doing the same for an artist with a disability. So one of those examples would be things like international residencies, where an artist would be provided an opportunity to be placed in another country, to be placed there as an artist, to be placed there to work alongside other local artists, to have sort of a cultural immersion experience and and and, and, and go through uh, an exercise where hopefully they would be advanced in their practice as an artist because of that experience. You know, I, I recall having a conversation probably about, oh, I guess almost three years ago when I first started where, you know, my previous staff were saying, that's that's so risky. We, you can't do that. Our artists are not used to that kind of change and, and, and it's really not going to be all that meaningful to them. Well, uh, A, that those particular staff members are gone, uh, but B, much more importantly, those artists, I mean, we sent five artists abroad last year, two to Dubai, three to Guadalajara. And I will tell you, A, those artists have come back to us saying how grateful they are that they were given that opportunity. But their outlook on life and their, their perspectives on their artistic practice and, and their position as artists have, have grown extraordinarily so. And, uh, and so we're celebrating those successes by continuing to provide those international uh, residency opportunities. So this year, we're not quite sure with the COVID travel restrictions, but we have received funding to actually launch a residency in Osaka, Japan. So we're going to continue that. Uh, and then the one other thing I was going to mention uh, is that, uh, um, you know, our artists, um, you know, they're being, they're being showcased in uh, newer venues and exciting venues, uh, both locally and around the world. And I, and I will tell you that, I have had family members that have come up to me sort of one year after another, where in the first year they said to me, I'm not really sure what this really means to have my son's work uh, be displayed in Dubai or have my son's work be displayed at uh, you know, the Contemporary Calgary Gallery. Um, and a year later, they come back to me and they go, wow, has that opportunity not, uh, ha that opportunity has just simply changed the confidence and the ability for my son to speak proudly about why he or she or why he is an artist and and speak proudly about uh, their their abilities as an artist and, and just how life changing that has been. So um, those are just some examples of some of the work that we've been doing and, and, and how proud we are as an organization to support them as artists. I, that's just, those are just incredible stories to see how it affects and, and, and I'm sure that just resonates throughout the community. I mean, obviously the word of mouth uh, amongst other artists, just, they must be banging on your doors to, you know, you say that waiting list, which is hopefully maybe one day you can get a bigger, bigger center, uh, to, you know, to accommodate more people. Um, so I guess kind of moving forward, what is the, what is the short term goals, um, you know, not really COVID related, but your short term goals for the indefinite art center. What's next? Absolutely short term. It is to build a new home. Uh, yeah. So uh, a lot of your viewers might know that uh, indefinite arts was quite a newsworthy organization two years ago because our facility was directly attached to the Fairview arena that had collapsed uh, literally in one piece in February of 2018. And since that time, we've been embarking on a journey to get public and private partners on board to help us rebuild a center that would be absolutely world-class. And I think that that's really the next step. In the past three years, we've demonstrated 
that by positioning ourselves as an arts organization, providing those kinds of programming opportunities for artists, our artists have thrived and the arts community has responded. And our artists are, like I said, making an income, you know, you know, increasing their confidence, increasing their communication and interpersonal skills that are helping them be better integrated into our communities. Now that next step, which I believe is a short term opportunity and I and and I have continued to have very encouraging conversations with both public and private sector partners but that next step is to rebuild uh, into a world-class environment where really there there are no limitations as far as what it is that they can create in whatever medium that they want to create it in no that's excellent so I guess outside of clicking uh, on in the comment section on your website, how can someone go about contacting you, becoming a partner, becoming a sponsor um, with the Indefinite Arts Centre? Well, we have a wide range of opportunities, obviously, as a charity for people to get involved with us. Uh, we, uh, you know, during non-COVID times, we have a very active volunteer program, and that could be spending a couple of hours in the studio and working alongside and supporting our artists. Um, so the, those are, and we have different events where we require volunteers. So volunteers really are also at the heart of, of what we do and who we are. And, uh, and then if, if individuals are willing to donate uh, and contribute financially, of course, as a charity, we would love to have their support. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, program that's actually generating a lot of popularity, uh, which is called the Artist Patron Program, which really allows uh, a donor to be connected directly to one of our artists and to uh, enter into a monthly giving program where they're being provided with um, pretty much monthly updates now uh, around the progress of that particular artist that they're supporting. And so um, the artists, uh, individuals who are interested can go to our website at ouriac.ca slash donate, and they can find information about making a one-time gift or making a monthly gift. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I will, I will add that, uh, you know, government funding for us uh, sits at around 40%. So the rest we, we raise through a variety of different channels and opportunities. And so uh, every extra dollar that we raise and on top of what we get through government allows us to do that much more in support of our, in support of our artists, whether that's allowing our artists to work on larger canvases or whether that's um, setting up uh, an exhibition in more exciting venues to get our artist's name out there, or whether that's to provide uh, more marketing support to get our artist's works out onto social media or other types of media. Uh, so uh, though those contributions are absolutely vital for us to, again, position ourselves as a strong arts organization supporting incredible artists. No, that, that's great. Thanks for sharing that information. And again, anybody wants to find out, the website is in the comment section. All you have to do is click on it and it will take you there. So I guess kind of to, to wrap up, I really appreciate you sharing your stories and your education. I'm they're, 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 I, I, I just, uh, again, that video, I can never talk about that video. And I highly recommend everybody going, checking out the two minute video at their website. It, it just gave me goosebumps and I love it. Um, if, I guess if you have one piece of advice for a small business, a startup, what would it be, just? Sorry, you kind of cut out, but I'm well, going to assume that you asked me what kind of advice I'd give to a, a small business or a nonprofit. Yes. Um, I laugh uh, inside of that question because, um, you know, when I first started this role, I was criticized a lot by, uh, again, former staff who said I was running the organization too much like a business, which kind of boggles my mind. And I think there's an ongoing struggle in the nonprofit world about, about that very question. Um, I absolutely believe that nonprofits need to be run like businesses. Um, aside from the fact that, of course, my end goal is not to expand profits, but in my case, it's about expanding financial capacity to support even more artists. Like, like you're saying, we need more capacity in terms of space, but also financial capacity to try and take a stab at that wait list to serve the needs of this incredible community that we are serving. And so uh, everything that we've done, I think, has been approached from that business lens. Again, from a strategic planning point of view, um, do we have a strat plan? Do we have a business plan? Do we have uh, a general awareness of what the awareness is, is like out in the community? Uh, what is our marketing strategy? Um, you know, how do we sell our business 
to our, our other set of major clients, which in our case are our donors and our funding partners. Um, you know, I shared with you, Jade, that uh, Indefinite Arts Centre, in this growth, in this 60% growth from $900,000 in revenues to $1.6 million in revenues, has taken, has been the result of some, ex, um, some pretty significant risk, I would say. We had $250,000 uh, in cash reserves when I first started, and I said, why are we keeping that in reserves, and we should be deploying this to marketing we need to be deploying this to oh, towards our fund development opportunities we need to be deploying this towards our rebranding if we believe that we needed to rebrand towards our strategic planning and uh, I, I guess i can't say proudly so but we did expend that fund over the course of two years right including restructuring and so uh and that's a huge risk for i think any business or nonprofit to eradicate their cash reserves over two years but you know what that came and, and that resulted in our ability to expand financial capacity. That allowed us to open one extra day to take on an extra 55 artists. That has allowed us to become, you know, the first Canadian arts organization to be installed at the world's busiest airport in Dubai. That has allowed us to take advantage of so many opportunities just by simply expanding our capacity. So my advice is, you know, take risks, especially for nonprofits. If there are any nonprofit leaders listening, uh, honestly, that that is by sitting sitting idly and watching the world go by when when so many things are changing and as you said, Jay, it's such a crowded environment right now for nonprofits to cut through that noise. I think you have to be very bold and 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 be comfortable about taking the risks that you want to take in order to increase your financial capacity. No, and, and thank you for sharing that that. Uh, Going through your reserves is something that uh, I, I've talked to nonprofits and charities about, and it is such a touchy subject. And they're like, "No, no, no, we need that. We need that in case." I was like, "Well, in case what? You're not around." And and it's something. I, and, and I mean, it might be a harsh thing to say to some of these people, but and that's I, I truly believe why you guys have been succeeding and growing, and and people want to be involved with you because you're investing that money, whether it be in. Well, basically, in people showing what, what you do for your artists. So, congratulations to doing that. It's a, a definite arts and an inspiration for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> and and on that note, I really appreciate you coming, yes, sharing your story today. Um, if anybody wants to find more information, please go to the website. It's in the, so, you know, thank you for being awesome, JS, and I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much, Jay. All right, everybody. I hope you guys have a great day. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.